Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Zip, Associate Editor of Solar Power World, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Speaking About Solar Thermal. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few uh, house cleaning items. I'd like to mention that this um, webinar will also be emailed to all attendees, um, the webinar and the slides. And also, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So you can submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar by typing it into the GoToMeeting panel um, in the questions box, which should be on your right. And lastly, we realize that not everyone who would have liked to attend this webinar could. So we encourage everyone to tweet about key topics um, discussed and takeaways uh, using the hashtag SolarWebinar. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have two great solar thermal experts here with us today, including Bill Gold. He is the Chief Technology Officer of Solar Reserve. And we also have Paul Rohr, who is Product Manager for Lock and Bar's uh, Solar Initiative. So thank you all again for being here with us today. All right, and we're actually going to start out with uh, Paul as our first presenter. Paul is a solar and residential uh, boiler product manager for the Lock and Bar Corporation. He's been in the plumbing, heating, and hydronic industry for over 22 years, and he was previously a licensed contractor with Radiant Design and Installation Experience. So thanks again for being with us here today, Paul, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Kathy. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as you'll see, these slides are numbered on the bottom right, so if you have a question, uh, there'll, of course, there'll be quite a few drawings, and um, those usually generate questions. So if you want to reference the slide number, uh, we can come back and answer those questions directly at the end of the presentation. Again, I'm Paul Roars with Lock and Bar Corporation. I'm product manager for the solar initiative. And again, what we're doing at Lock and Bar is doing commercial solar thermal and domestic water production. Specifically, what we're doing is forced uh, circulation with closed loop systems. So we'd like to run through the basics, if you will, a 101 um, on the uh, solar thermal closed loop systems. We'll then move forward with system operation. Uh, after that, we'll talk quite a bit about the value of storage and why that is so important in solar thermal systems for domestic water production. And then finally, we'll talk about a modular design and how it's also applicable for retrofit applications. Uh, so again, right out of the gate, let's get started with a basic system. A little bit about that with uh, sensor placement, differential control, and our um, sequence of operation. And to do that, we really need to look at a diagram, look at the players in the system, how they all integrate, and then we can kind of move forward together. So let's dissect a basic solar thermal system for domestic water production, and we'll go through the basic components. Here is an example of a two tank system uh, with an external brace plate exchanger. Of course, this is a solar thermal collector. Uh, we have cool water going in. It is heated by the sun. And then comes out here at the top is uh, hot water. This pump station is a key player here where it's, uh, this pump station houses a circulator, a differential controller, expansion tank, port, relief valve, and so on. So then we transfer that heated water through this external brace plate exchanger, and we transfer it again via the secondary circulator into our primary, excuse me, our solar thermal storage tank. Again, this is for circulation in solar preheat. All of our incoming cold um, inlet water is down here on the bottom. It is preheated by solar, and then travels up into, um, on over into our primary storage. I'm kind of moving my mouse here slowly. So you can track that path. That preheated water is then stored in our primary storage tank until it falls below set point. And at that time when that tank falls below its set point, we have our backup heat source here uh, to get that final temper of hot water. So again, a lot going on here. Uh, our sensors are located right here in tank number one, as well as we have a sensor located clear up here on the collector so that we know what uh, temperature the fluid in the collector is and we can compare and differentiate. Uh, again, this differential controller over here located within our pump station looks at the tank sensor, it looks at the collector sensor, and measures that differential. And when the fluid in the collector is above that of the tank, and the tank is below its set point, 
this differential controller, which again is the brains of the operation, then energizes that pump and turns on and starts moving that fluid so we can start harvesting BTUs back down into this tank. So again, that's a basic system. That's where the basic players are. That's how the sensors are located. And as a sequence of operation, it was just that. So tank has to be below its set point. The collector temperature has to be above that set point plus the differential. And then we turn that circulator on and start harvesting heat. So again, the basic tenets of uh, solar are very, very simple. Um, and again, as a backup, let's say for the sake of argument, the solar thermal set point, we can load this tank all the way up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a very normal uh, tank temperature for a glass line tank to achieve. We can load that to 180 degree storage. Again, on the back side here for our backup and primary storage, very common in the industry to have a second set point that can be at 140 degree set point. So again, within the basic solar thermal operation, it's very common to have multiple set points because this water heater only needs to back up primary storage to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can introduce this and load this tank fully based on how much solar thermal energy is available that day. So again, very uh, basic sequence of operation there. Moving forward, maybe. There we go. There's our system operation. Sorry for the delay. We're going to talk a little bit about stagnation and benefits. Uh, that kind of moves pretty quickly there. So again, we talked about the temperature at the collector and the temperature at the tank. And when that temperature differential is, uh, is, is great enough and we meet that differential temperature, we turn that thick circulator on. But what happens when we achieve the set point? Again, this tank is going to try and load itself to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and then shut off. Well, when that temperature at the collector is uh, equal to that temperature in the tank, this circulator right here is going to shut off. Well, what happens then? Well, this is, again, for circulation closed loop system. It is pressurized to 60 PSI. So when we pressurize that system to 60 PSI but, and we shut off that circulator, Again, that fluid is bound in the collector. It is captive. It's not going anywhere. And if, again, we have a great potential to harvest solar thermal energy, and that thermal energy is hitting this collector, that temperature in the collector is then going to rise. And it's going to keep rising until it reaches a uh, temperature called stagnation, or a, a temperature point called stagnation. That is ultimately when there is no more, or when there is solar thermal energy available to harvest, but there is nowhere else to store it because this tank has achieved its set point. Okay, so that stagnation condition then, uh, we turn that fluid into steam, we evacuate that system uh, of fluid, and that is then vapor locked right here. And again, as we are pressurized to 60 PSI, uh, we force all the fluid out of the collector where it's housed in our expansion tank. Again, steam within a closed loop solar thermal system is not a bad thing, uh, again, because we're very well suited to handle these stagnation conditions. But again, as we are pressurized to 60 PSI, that takes our stagnation temperature up, uh, up above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, we are fully designing around operating temperatures. Again, our operating temperature we're designing around is 248 degrees Fahrenheit. So with a stagnation temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit, um, uh, even a 50% propylene glycol solution introduced into the system so that we can freeze protect, we would then freeze protect to 20 below ambient. So what does that all mean and how does that all tie together? Well, again, being pressurized to 60 PSI, our stagnation temperature above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. If we go into stagnation and we have a domestic draw and now we have the potential to harvest and load these tanks again, we only have to drop below 300 degrees Fahrenheit just marginally to recondense and start harvesting again. So again, the added benefit of poor circulation is these very high working temperatures, these prolonged harvest periods that are available, and the ability to load these tanks to a very high level. That's a very good benefit for us. And again, what we're looking to do is by loading up these tanks to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, is to prolong the off time of the backup heat source. And at the minimum, if it's a modulating appliance, we want to affect this for a lower firing rate. So we want to uh, reap the benefits of that design of force circulation just by loading these tanks to the greatest ability we can. Now here's a uh, basically a same but different, well, got a little way, got away from me there a little bit. 
Here's the same type of application where we're using a different product, a little bit smaller scale product where we're directly feeding a uh, gas-fired appliance as backup, a single tank chassis, if you will. So again, it's still a two tank system. We still have the merits of solar preheat here. All incoming cold water is preheated to this vessel. And then we send that preheated water on out to our final tempering device. So again, just want to give you a cross section uh, of a different application. Now in that same venue, we're going to move forward and again, just a slight variation of what you saw earlier with this two heat, or excuse me, two tank preheat system. But what we hadn't illustrated previously was a ASE, ASSE certified mixing device. So when we can load these tanks to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and this primary storage to 140, we absolutely need to ensure we have an ASSE certified mixing via, uh, valve downstream of the system. I just didn't introduce that previously uh, just for a clarity on the uh, original basis of design. So again, a lot of versatility here with an external brace plate exchanger as well. This can be single wall or double wall depending on the code compliance. And again, this differential controller right here can control this secondary circulator. So again, we want to be very clear about how uh, even a basic system is, uh, is uh, uh, defined. So again, let's move forward a little bit and talk about the value of storage. That kind of went a little bit quick here. Here's the same uh, principle right here, preheat on our primary, or excuse me, preheat vessel right here for solar. Here's our primary storage. But we really want to drill down now and talk about not just the collector, but the value of all the storage on the project and how that comes into play. So if you can, picture in your mind's eye that even though this is a singular collector displayed right here, I want you to picture that this is 14 collectors. Uh, basically, 14 of our largest collectors, as shown here, would equal 1,820 square foot of collector space. Uh, at that point, we're going to simulate um, a certain number of gallons per day as a total domestic load, a finite number of gallons per day. Of course, we have some heating appliances here backing up that load. And then we size our storage tanks uh, accordingly. Again, one of the rules of thumb in the industry is to have at least one gallon of storage per square foot of collector space. It's very important that we have at least a gallon of storage per square foot of collector space up on the roof. Now let's move forward. Again, we have 1,820 square foot of collector space on the roof. We have a primary, excuse me, a solar storage tank of 318 degrees. Let me back up here if I can. Well, let's just keep moving forward here. So that solar preheat tank was 318 gallons of storage. Our primary storage tank was 752 gallons. And what we did was we went out and used our solar thermal software and we did a design based on the total gallons of, day, uh, of uh, domestic water used per day, also based on the boiler heat load. And then we ran a simulation. And that simulation looked at all 365 days of the year of historical weather data for that region we run it in. So it looks at entering water temp. And if we have enough storage per square foot of collector space, these collector temperatures will be very mild. But if we deviate from that gallon of storage per square foot, these collector temperatures then are going to be well above this uh, stagnation temperature that we talked about earlier. Again, we know that even when we're pressurized to 60 PSI, any temperature shown above 300 degrees Fahrenheit is in stagnation. And that temperature and that collector system or that solar thermal system is then not really a usable system. So again, if we look at that and redesign that system, let's drop down here a little bit. We went back and remodeled it. We removed four of these largest collectors uh, off of the roof. We bumped up the nominal storage of our preheat. We bumped up the nominal amount of storage on our primary, and we ran that same simulation. Again, we changed no other variables within that simulation. Again, all based on historical weather data. And now look at this collector temperature. We're well in line with a much more usable, much more responsibly designed solar thermal system here at a much higher solar fraction. Again, this solar fraction represents a percentage that we're looking for for the amount of solar thermal energy harvested by the collector divided by the total amount of energy needed by the, uh, the boiler plant and pumping energies and so on. So again, by removing collectors and adding a nominal amount of storage, we have not only a much more efficient system, we have a much more responsibly designed system so that we're not going to approach these uh, stagnation conditions. So let's boil that down into a little bit of a summary here. That first uh, iteration then was 
1,820 square foot of collector space. You saw that 318 gallon storage tank plus the 752 gallon storage tank. That gave us a cumulative of 1,070 gallons of storage. Again, that was well below the threshold of one gallon of storage per square foot of collector space. And even though we had a very decent solar fraction, we had high tendencies to stagnation. Now moving forward, what we can say then is by removing 520 square foot of collector space and adding a nominal 302, 302 gallons of storage, we were again back above that gallon of storage per square foot of collector space. And again, we achieved a very healthy solar fraction and more importantly, very low frequencies of stagnation. If we don't have proper storage, that collector array will get into an unusable situation. And even though it looks good on paper, like it did over here, um, again, we want to be on guard against artificially high solar fractions if we are less than a gallon of storage per square foot of collector space. Again, very important the amount of storage we have on a, um, in a mechanical room to, to load these systems. Now moving forward just a little bit about modular design and retrofit. Uh, let's look at a system that was designed um, in Florida that did use some of our appliances for the um, solar thermal backup, excuse me, the thermal backup of the appliance and storage. But in essence, this was someone else's system. They moved away from a force circulation principle. They went to a drain back system. Again, I'm not disparaging drain back. It's a very uh, viable option. But in this particular instance, what they did was they used this drain back tank um, for the solar thermal collector. So down here is our circulator. It pumped fluid out of the collector, or excuse me, out of the vessel. It went up to the collector array. I'm losing my mouse functionality here. There we go. The solar thermal energy was then harvested at the collector array. It was then deposited back into the storage tank where it was then transferred to the domestic water. So again, under that same principle, here's all of our incoming cold water up here. It travels down through this coil. The cold uh, domestic water travels on down through these um, reverse return tanks and is stored here. When this storage temperature uh, falls below its set point, we're going to bring the temperature on or bring the signal uh, the call for heat for this uh, heating appliances and start um, energizing so we can satisfy these tank temperatures down here. So what happened was on a call for heat, the thermal energy from these heating appliances traveled on through this piping arrangement, traveled back down through this coil, traveled through that coil, and was then deposited into the tank until it satisfied that set point. That was a very good basic theoretical understanding of how thermal energy works. But what actually happened in the system was that by transferring thermal energy from the, our, the water heating appliance into this tank, we then reduce the amount of uh, storage available to load with solar. So we're displacing solar storage by thermal energy from the heating appliance, and we micro-reduce, we reduce the storage capacity in, in a certain volume every day and reduce the ability to load this tank with solar. So again, this is not something we advise, this is what not to do. We just want you to be, again, on guard on uh, reducing that storage capacity of any solar thermal uh, system. We want as much storage volume as we can, because if you're not using thermal energy um, on demand, we want to have as much time to load that tank and store it until we can use it. So again, this is a principle of what not to do. Well, what would we propose? While within that same venue, we're going to take that same drawing with our two water heating appliances. Here are our tanks down here that are reverse returned, again, properly applied. And again, what we're going to do is apply that solar preheat and force circulation. We're going to take all incoming cold potable water. We're going to use a reverse return principle, so first in, last out in this concept. We're going to take the thermal energy from the solar, deposit it into a stainless steel coil. What you can't see here is this has a heat exchanger in it. So this cold incoming water is heated via solar indirectly. That preheated water then travels on up into our, our um, backup over here. It is deposited into our storage tanks until it is, uh, falls below at that point, and as then at that point need to bring on our backup heating appliances. Again, so within the venue of force circulation and solar preheat, 
um, loading our systems, pressurizing our systems to 60 PSI. We have a lot of versatility in terms of high working temperatures, high stagnation, um, coming out of stagnation at very high temperatures, and the ability to prolong these harvesting times. So again, a very versatile system with solar preheat and poor circulation. And that is basically very easy then to retrofit solar onto in any application. And then that is ultimately an abbreviated version of this uh, of solar thermal and poor circulation. But I want to give you a very good taste of foundational principles, the value of storage, how we move forward with a basis of design, and how set points come into play and how these working temperatures um, all tie a system together. So Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you until we have a question and answer period later. Uh, and again, thank you everybody for your time. All right, thank you very much, Paul, for that great information. Um, and we will now move on to our second speaker, Bill Gold. He brings more than 30 years of technical experience to Solar Reserve in engineering, procurement, and construction of power plants and power-related systems. Uh, the last 12, he has largely dedicated to solar energy installation. He was principal consultant with Sustainable Energy Projects with a focus on advising U.S. and international utilities on uh, the development of solar power and trough practices. Prior positions also include engineering and project management at Bechtel and General Atomic. He's also written a number of technical papers on solar energy. Uh, Bill will be speaking more from the development side of solar thermal. So Bill, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Let's get right into it. Let's see if I can. There we go. I'm going to just briefly touch on background for our company. We're a California-based company. There, there we are, California-based company that uh, developed molten salt power towers. It's a technology that is owned by uh, Rocketdyne, the same folks who do the um, space shuttle main engines. And we have a project pipeline of probably 30 different projects in the United States and around the world with two executed uh, power purchase agreements that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, I'm going to move on rather than to spend too much time on our company. This is what it looks like. This is utility scale. We produce electricity in the range of 50 to perhaps 300 megawatts uh, connected to a large utility. What you see here is a large field of almost a mile and a half in diameter. And each of those dots is a mirror that reflects the light of the sun to a heat exchanger at the top of a tall tower. Each of the, this, the picture may be a little deceiving. Each of those dots is about the size of a highway billboard, about 65 square meters. I'll show you how it works. We take the heliostat, these mirrors, and bounce the sun to this heat exchanger on the top of a tower. We call it a receiver. Our working fluid is actually a liquid salt. It's a mixture of potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate. Stored in large tanks at the base of the tower, in our cold tank, the temperature is around 550 degrees Fahrenheit. After the salt comes down off the tower, we store it in a hot tank that is about 1,050 to 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> now, we can keep the salt in these tanks for weeks and months without fear of freezing. Every inch of piping and these tanks are all electrically heat traced, so in case there were a protracted plant shutdown, you could always keep it liquid. But the insulation is so thick that uh, we don't have to use elect electric heat tracing very much. When the utility wants power, when they want electricity, we pump the hot salt through a steam generator train composed of several heat exchange vessels. We boil water to steam and drive a normal steam turbine generator. Most of these plants are located out into the desert where water is scarce. We can use dry cooling or uh, evaporative cooling if water is available. The technology was validated during the 1990s at a demonstration plant funded by the Department of Energy. The uh, 
test basically validated three key, three key principles. First of all, that the surround field worked and the receiver worked using molten salt. It was the first time it had ever been done. Secondly, that the efficiency of the thermal storage was very, very good, better than 98%. And third, that you could take a large population of heliostats and track the sun and accurately point the sunlight to this heat exchanger at the top of the tower. Now, this technology started with the uh, space industry it, with Rocketdyne. This image on the left is of the space shuttle main engine, and the, I guess the image on the right shows the nozzles of those engines just prior to ignition. Um, some folks have sometimes wondered, well, why is it that you have uh, this space technology as part of uh, a solar program? Let me show you why. This is, in fact, uh, one of the nozzles for the space shuttle. And when I first uh, was watching these rockets take off, I thought that this was just a big steel shell that controlled the hot gases coming out of the ignition chamber. It's much more than that. This white pipe is actually a distribution pipe containing liquid hydrogen. It comes down from the storage tanks, goes into a distribution ring, uh, and then um, what you see here is a shell is not solid. It's actually almost paper-thin tubes. And this liquid hydrogen flows back in these little tubes. They're about a quarter inch in diameter. Flows back into the combustion chamber where it meets liquid oxygen, it ignites, and then the flame shoots out. There's huge temperature differences across the walls of those tubes, about 3,500 degrees centigrade. Now, it's kind of similar to our receiver design. Here, here's the receiver. Our receiver is nominally a cylinder, but it's composed of tubes, just like on this space shuttle engine. Uh, we have 14 flat panels that contain our salt and receive the solar flux. Turns out that the design challenge for our solar receiver is far, far easier than the space shuttle. The temperature differences across the tubes on the receiver uh, are only about 400 degrees. This is how it's organized. We have the receiver, this heat exchanger, at the top of a 60-story tower. The salt tanks are on, on grade at the base of the tower. And when it's time to operate, we take salt from the cold tank up this blue line to the receiver, which you see in cutaway. It gets heated up by the, by the rays of the sun. It comes down this red line and is deposited into the hot tank, where we keep it uh, until it's time to make electricity. When it's time to generate electricity, we pump hot salt from this tank through these steam generator vessels that are shown here in tin, and then it goes back into the cold tank. The salt is not consumed. Uh, it's reused over and over and over again. This is what our heliostats look like. In the top right, you see the front side of the heliostat, and each heliostat is composed of probably 30 individual mirrors. The back side is supported by a bunch of steel uh, trusses and beams to keep the uh, surface absolutely flat or with a very slight curvature. This particular heliostat is shown um, at uh, the Sandia National Labs where it's being tested for the quality of the image. And then this is what the heliostat field itself looks like from the center to the furthest heliostat is about 1,600 meters. And the center is actually offset a little bit to the south for plants in the northern hemisphere to optimize the flux from each mirror. Now, we believe in modular construction, too, but it's on a very large scale. Each of these 10 circles represents one power tower. We did this conceptual layout for a client in the southern hemisphere. You'll recognize that. This is about 10 kilometers wide, 
and um, about seven kilometers deep. But if you can have a large need for power, you can modularize these as well. <clears throat> now, this is the biggest advantage of our system. This gray line shows actual data from photovoltaic panels, which respond to the passage of every cloud that casts a shadow across them. It's very erratic. This olive-colored line, brown-colored line, is a uh, trough or a tower plant that has no storage. Now, the, you'll recognize that this is plotted across the scale of the time of day. And um, the, the graph is not producing well on screen here. Um, but let me show you if I can. Our formatting got messed up here a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you the basic uh, principle, though. Utilities want to generate power from noon to about 7 p.m. or later. Um, but you can collect energy all morning long. And if you collect it and save it, you can discharge the electricity in the afternoon time when the price of electricity is much higher. You can shift your generation to the time that the utility wants. Now, I'll show you three projects that we're working on. We've started construction on this plant, which is in Nevada. It's halfway between Las Vegas and Reno. It's near a town called Tonopah. This picture in the bottom is an artist's rendering of what it'll look like when the plant is completed. We've started construction on it. We're going to have our gala groundbreaking ribbon cutting uh, probably in October sometime. There are two other plants that we have uh, contracts with. One is in Spain. This one, uh, Alcazar de San Juan, Ciudad Real, is located about 150 kilometers south and east of Madrid. We haven't yet commenced construction on that, but we have the contracts. This plant is in California, north of uh, Blythe. Uh, we have a contract with Pacific Gas and Electric to build this plant and uh, produce electricity from that. Across the world, uh, we are developing plants in other countries as well. We have offices in South Africa, which is very active from a solar standpoint, and in Madrid and London. And we're also evaluating opportunities in Australia, India, and uh, next week I'll be in uh, Saudi Arabia. Well, that's a quick overview of uh, Solar Reserve. And I'd be happy to answer any questions when the time comes. Kathy? All right. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, we appreciate all that information. And I'm sure after all of that, our audience does have some questions. So. We'll begin that uh, question and answer session now. And the first question that I see here is actually for Paul. Um, someone wants to know um, how you can monitor system performance um, on the systems you discussed, such as for uh, rebate-based areas. How can we monitor system performance? Uh, great question. Um, mm -hmm. Within that differential controller and most modern controllers now, uh, they have a built-in SD card because we, we can measure the temperature of the outgoing fluid and the temperature of the fluid coming back. We then know the temperature difference, or delta T. When we know that delta T and then we know the flow rate going through this system, we can then extrapolate harvested BTUs and then model that backwards to see what we have for actual performance compared to what we designed on paper. So again, very, very easy, very common in the industry now to validate system design, look at real harvesting numbers, uh, and, and um, validate, verify what we've done on a system once we've done commissioning and startup. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, and then, Bill, someone would like you to um, please discuss the relative cost of heliostats and if there's much innovation from the industry on heliostat design. Oh, that's a good question. There are probably five companies that uh, provide heliostats today. And uh, we have our own design, but I have to say that um, we don't think that's the core 
of our business. Um, and if we found someone else's design that was um, more cost effective and had higher performance, uh, we would switch it immediately. For us, it's a little bit like uh, buying a pump or a, a tank. As far as the uh, innovation goes, um, you've got huge disparity in how people have uh, designed heliostats. E-Solar has the smallest one at 1.1 square meters. And I believe the largest I've seen is the ATS heliostat uh, presently in Albuquerque at 150 square meters. Ours is kind of in the middle. Um, but I think that there's room for looking at three aspects, the glass or the glass panel, the um, drive mechanism, and then the overall uh, structural support for the glass. And I think that we'll see a reduction of at least 30% in the cost of heliostats over the next three years. All right, and that same person also um, wanted to know if nanotech uh, services are under consideration. Uh, nanotech services have been discussed in terms of the um, storage of heat in uh, molten salt tanks and with um, uh, heat exchangers where a uh, nano surface can increase the heat transfer coefficient. At this point, it's still in the laboratory. Uh, no one in the industry has yet been able to um, commercialize the interesting research that's going on right now. All right. And, um, and for Paul, uh, can you have more than one set point in a solar thermal system? Yes, you can. In fact, um, without going back to um, um, one of the slides, but especially in a two-tank system, uh, that differential controller is going to, again, house and monitor those sensors at the collector and the, the solar thermal tank. And then, again, another set point uh, could be from the backup heating appliance to the primary storage tank. So, again, uh, very common to see more than one set point in a solar thermal system. All right. Um, and then we'll go back to Bill here. Uh, what is the technology that's used to store the hot molten salt? The hot molten salt is just stored in a liquid uh, state. Um, we uh, have engineered the materials so that it can accommodate the high temperatures. In the cold tank, uh, the uh, tanks are typically constructed of plain carbon steel. And in the hot tank, they're usually a stainless or even a high nickel alloy, but most typically a stainless steel. Um, you have uh, pumps that are typically immersed in the, in the uh, tank with a pump and pillar bell near the floor of the tank. The tanks are inserted through the top to the roof of the tank. Does that answer the question? Um, hopefully so. <laughs> uh, if not, you know, I'll, I'm sure they'll sub submit another follow-up. Um, OK, and then this one is not. Um, addressed to anyone, um, but they're wondering if you've looked at any designs uh, where much larger thermal storage could be made available as maybe an in-ground insulated vessel um, at atmospheric pressure instead of the three-bar collector pressure system you showed. Was, was that you, Bill? Or? Well, our tanks are um, atmospheric. Uh, they're added open to the atmosphere. Uh, we have looked at the possibility of um, having the tanks be underground and using the soil as a form for concrete or steel. Uh, but it turns out that the construction costs are higher to put the tanks into the ground than just to keep them um, up at grade. There's also a question if you uh, buried the tanks, uh, can you effectively detect uh, any leakage? Uh, whereas if they're above grade, uh, you'll quickly detect it and be able to take remedial action. All right. Um, and then I'm sure you can both answer this, but Paul, um, do you think there's a future for CSP in China, somebody wants to know? Um, CFP. Concentrated? Right, for the concentrated solar power in China. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, solar, again, the basic tenants are very, very common. Again, we're focused solely on domestic water production. Um, and to that end, um, mid to industrial scale projects. Um, so again, that's when you get into the concentrated focus stuff, you're talking about large BTUs and large loads and then power generation. So that really is moving beyond the realm of what we're focused on here at Lock and Bar. Good question, though. But I'll add to Paul's remark by saying that uh, I've been uh, over uh, prospecting <laughs> in uh, China already, and I'm returning in December uh, to uh, meet with local developers. Uh, the challenge in China is going to be, uh, can CSB compete against uh, PV, photovoltaics? Uh, as you know, most of the uh, PV panels are made in China and then imported into this country and the costs are very low. All right, and um, this question is also for both of you. Maybe we can start with Paul and then go back to Bill again. Um, someone would like to know, are PV, system, or PV systems degrade over their useful life? So they're asking, how much of a factor is degradation for your systems? Actually, that's not a factor for us. Again, um, some of the mistakes and the learning lessons they've, they've got back from the 70s, um, the construction quality has really improved. And even though there's typically, let's say, a 10-year warranty on collectors, you're looking at a 30-year-plus life expectancy. So the materials that we use now, uh, specifically, I would say, the insulations with the mineral wool insulations, um, they really have reduced the amount of outgassing that has occurred over the course of time. And because we reduced that outgassing principle, the glass stays clear longer. It's, again, uh, long periods of time with no degradation or no, um, no obstruction or efficiency losses of that collector. So again, the, the quality of the collectors have only ever gotten better. So and that's helped us with our longevity and efficiencies. I'll add that the PV degradation that uh, the questioner refers to is real. Um, and usually taken into consideration when you do your economics for the project. Uh, our company does both PV and CSP. Uh, in terms of the CSP, uh, it's a different phenomenon. It's not the degradation at the molecular level that the PV guys have to contend with. We talk sometimes about could there be a degradation in the quality of the glass in the heliostats, but we've looked at uh, the heliostats that are um, 20 years old from Solar One, and the reflectors on the trough plants at Kramer Junction from 1980, and there's less than a percent uh, opacity uh, taking place. So essentially no degradation. All right, and um, I think we'll, we'll end uh, with one more question for each here. Um, Paul, I believe this one's for you because we were talking about monitoring. Uh, someone wants to know, what about using a system like Sun Reports for monitoring? Uh, we look forward to working with those folks. Again, a lot of what can be done um, within a standalone pump station with integral differential controller, we can monitor, again, incoming and outgoing temperatures. We can monitor uh, the flow rate and then extract all that information. But a lot of times these end users want to see um, and visibly projected to a separate uh, monitor, so in kind of Show you, shows you in real time what you're harvesting, what the uh, return on investment is, and we look forward to partnering with those folks, but that is not a part of uh, our integral package. But yes, they're becoming more and more valuable, especially as it pertains to systems that require, uh, again, mostly commercial DDC or direct digital control systems, uh, and again, we can integrate those in. So yeah, we look forward to working with those folks. All right, and one more for you too, Bill. Uh, with, with the high wind conditions often experienced in deserts like the Barstow area, why use such large heliostats? Uh, doesn't that argue for smaller size designs? Well, Kathy, that's a particularly insightful question. Um, we had at Solar 2 heliostats of two sizes. One was 39 square meters and the other was about 93 square meters. When the wind comes up, the loads on the heliostats do increase and you have to uh, design for it. You, you also accommodate those loads, first of all, by operational control. When the wind comes up, you turn the mirrors horizontal so that only the edge of the glass is 
presented to uh, the force of the wind. And in that configuration, all our designs in all sizes can accommodate uh, a hurricane of more than 90 miles an hour. Um, but that is one of the trade-offs you make when you size your heliostat. The uh, questioner is correct that the larger the square uh, area is of the heliostat, uh, the uh, higher the loads. And uh, sometimes that's worthwhile, and sometimes not. You have to do a cost trade-off in order to balance it off. All right. Well, thank you both so much. That was a, a very great um, question and answer session. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, as you'll see, Bill and Paul's information is on screen. Um, you can contact them in another way um, at a later time. But I'd like to thank everyone again, um, our presenters, for being here to share uh, what they know about uh, solar thermal with us, and thank everyone in our audience for listening. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. and. Um, also know that Solar Power World will be doing webinars monthly, so keep an eye out for more to come. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy.